So now we have come to the very important part of uh, magnetic interaction known as exchange interaction. Basically exchange energy in a magnetic lattice usually write it like this H exchange is nothing but Jij which is an exchange integral Si dot Sj but Si and Sj are the local spins or magnetic moments in a system. So that means we have this lattice I showed you in a figure earlier also and this can be between nearest neighbors or it can be between next nearest neighbors and that H exchange energy please note the term exchange energy is given by this is the exchange integral it is known I will show why it is exchange integral si dot sj in a magnetic lattice this is responsible for the alignment in the order state so you can see this ij as i showed you just now that can be nearest neighbors often that works next nearest neighbor it can be directional also so i will discuss later at least briefly take you through the various magnetic interactions that are possible in a solid. I must say this nature of interactions are so varied are so interesting uh, that uh, magnetic neutron diffraction is possibly the most popular tool to understand magnetic interactions and the structures and right from the beginning of neutron scattering till date it has been used extensively to understand the interaction but the exchange energy there are atomic spins so the question comes is it a dipole dipole interaction because I can understand that in a lattice at a side there is one magnetic dipole and then another side maybe nearest neighbor maybe next nearest neighbor there is another dipole and is it a dipole dipole interaction And the answer is no. Magnetic exchange energy is not a dipole-dipole interaction because the interaction between two magnetic dipoles is very weak, goes as 1 by r to the power 3. And also it comes to if it comes to energy, it will be few kts. Whereas the room temperature is equivalent to 30 milli electron volt. And that can be few MeVs, MeVs. So this is so much smaller than room temperature that if it is only dipole-dipole, we will not have any magnetic alignment at room temperature. We can't have. Whereas iron gets aligned very early, iron Curie temperature, the alignment from paramagnetic to ferromagnetic phase is very high. Iron, cobalt, nickel, they're all room temperature. That is because the root of exchange interaction is not in dipole dipole in, uh, interaction but it is electronic so i will come to that now so it is electronic and it is much stronger than magnetic dipole dipole interaction so i have written down the i have just taken the simplest example hydrogen like molecule so you have got an atom a and an electron 1, an atom B, an electron 2. So the interaction energy between these two, as I have written down, it is the interaction between electron, 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 nucleus, 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 electron, and nucleus, nucleus. So I will write it down as I have shown here. So V A B between two sides. So I have got atom A and atom B. This is A and B and this is one electron. So hydrogen like. But this clarifies the concept. So it is equal to E square 
then it is 1 R A B plus 1 by R 1 2 minus 1 by R A 1 minus 1 by R B 2. Let me, can you go back? Hmm. R A B R 1 2 B 1 A 2. Now let me see. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, I made a mistake here. This is the distance between the electrons and A that is already the A2 and B1. So electron nucleus, 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 electron, 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 nucleus, electron, nucleus. But this is purely Coulombic in nature. Our J exchange, it is due to electron interaction but not purely Coulombic. It comes from exchange interaction. Uh, it comes from the, the exchange between electrons between the two I can say it is due to Pauli exclusion principle that exchange of electrons between 1 and 2 gives me the exchange energy. So the Coulombic term is there and the exchange term is there and I have written down this exchange term. So please note that electron 1 is there. Then I have VAB, then we have exchange. Electron 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 1, and this is integrated over interspace. space. This gives me the exchange energy. Interestingly, the origin of this lies in Pauli exclusion principle. You can see here all I have done is actually I have just put electron A at 1 and to electron A at 2 and I have taken two states where the electrons have been exchanged. This is possible for identical particles and in this case following Fermi Dirac statistics. A similar thing we have also you might have seen it when you write down the Slater determinant for a n electron system. Uh, so Jij is calculated, it is a calculation of this uh, integral where we have exchange, we have psi a star 1, psi b star 2 which is exactly what you see here, then the inter the interaction energy and between these two states the between these two states where the electrons are exchanged and this interestingly there is no typical classical force term that I can bring in to explain the exchange energy it is simply because of the Pauli exclusion principle of two identical electrons at two atomic sites I can exchange the two and create a new state and this J is basically the evaluation of the between the two states of the exchange interaction VAB. If you remember even in neutron diffraction I did that earlier when I took a plane wave state another plane wave state and between the two I put the interaction potential it is exactly same only here the state of the system is psi A2 psi B1 which is after exchange and psi a1 psi b2 before exchange complex conjugate and it is uh, I can say in the typical formula quantum mechanical formula and this term is appearing due to pure exchange interaction coming due to Pauli exclusion principle. <coughs> this Jij calculation is involved what I showed you earlier the actual physical extension of the electronic wave function from here 
you can see that this JIG can be calculated for any system depending what are the electrons that are responsible for the exchange and then that turns out to be much higher than what you can get from a magnetic dipole-dipole interaction. So this is the origin and magnetic interaction is much much less than KT but J is can be as comparable or higher compared to KT and that dictates the alignment. So <clears throat> this is what I showed you and interestingly because this depends on the overlap integral for the electronic wave functions so this J it can change sign depending on whether we can take the atoms closer or farther. So the if you consider the exchange integral J E for low values it is negative and then it is positive. Now if J E is uh, sorry is less than 0 because the way I have written you can see if it is less than 0 then SI dot SJ should be negative to lower the energy and antiferromagnetic alignment is preferred whereas above a certain distance because the electronic overlap integral changes sign it becomes positive and when J is greater than 0 we get ferromagnetic order. So I just mentioned here simple calculations can show that if RAB in case of iron it is 3.26 cobalt 3.64 nickel 3.94 so these are all ferromagnetic because we have gone above 0 part of the exchange integral whereas chromium where it is 2.6 it is not a ferromagnetic material because the J is negative in its case. Uh, now let me quickly introduce you to the bulk properties of the magnetic material. It is important to know because the bulk measurements will tell you whether it is a ferromagnet or it is a ferrimagnet or it is an antiferromagnet in a in a very uh, what should I say in a very macroscopic manner. So let me just quickly write down the field that we calculate. The field inside a magnetic material is given by the applied magnetic field plus into the magnetism induced in the system. If it is M then we also know that susceptibility of a material is nothing but M by H that is the magnetic moment induced per applied field. So that when I write that then B is becoming equal to H plus 4 pi chi H equal to 1 plus 4 pi chi H equal to mu H the word mu is the permittivity of the medium. So these are very relationships you are well aware of but I just write it for completeness sake so that when later we discuss there shouldn't be any confusion. So now coming back to ferromagnets and you saw the chi. The chi for a ferromagnet follows a something called Curie Weiss law. Curie-Weiss law says the chi with temperature goes as C upon T minus Tc and this Tc is known as Curie temperature. So you can see at uh, T equal to Tc the susceptibility diverges to infinity and for antiferromagnetic order chi goes as C upon T plus Tn where Tn is known as nil temperature. So neutron diffraction is done below nil temperature or Curie temperature for the ordered state and we also do neutron diffraction 
above the ordering temperature and uh, let me just tell you that uh, in case of ferromagnet because it is chi is equal to c upon t minus tc if i plot c or 1 by chi 1 by chi is equal to t minus tc by c so you can see that it is a straight line 1 by chi plotted against temperature cuts the axis somewhere you can see it is t by tc tc by c it's a constant which dictates the curie temperature not exactly equal to curie temperature curie temperature it cuts and at curie temperature it uh, comes to zero and similarly for a uh, antiferromagnet because chi is equal to c upon t plus tn so the 1 by chi plot hits it the negative side of the axis and this is a tn minus something t so if i write though i am not allowed to write temperature as negative we need the absolute scale but it cuts at minus tn and we get the relationship t minus tn t plus tn so this is one by chi plot for uh, a ferromagnet and the antiferromagnet like chromium mno and ferromagnet ferrimagnet will have other ordered states will have this kind of behavior so we can measuring the susceptibility we can at least understand whether it is a ordered state is a ferromagnet or an antiferromagnet but on the other hand if it is a ferromagnet state the ordered moment as we raise temperature you can see the magnetic moment it undergoes a second order phase transition here m is the order parameter for a magnetic phase transition from ferro to para so this is a paramagnet this is a ferromagnet in paramagnet it is uh, zero for uh, the sample whereas in the magnetic state you can see the magnetic moment rises to a high value the second order phase transition uh, the sources are mentioned here from it so now we do experiments here as well as here we shall get to when i discuss the neutron diffraction and before that let me give you the idea about the hysteresis loop because even before we do any kind of diffraction studies when you make a sample the first thing we can do is to measure the hysteresis loop so the hysteresis loop though you have i am sure you have done it let me just bring it to you so here it is b versus h so first if i take a piece of iron let's say it's non magnetic because its moments are all misoriented when you heat it when you sorry not heat it i'm sorry when you raise the temperature the with the applied magnetic field the induced magnetic field also increases it reaches a saturation 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 but when i reduce the field the magnetization decrease i'm sorry decreases but when i reach zero zero magnetic field it does not go back to zero from where i started because i have already aligned the domains and they will remain aligned now if i start applying a magnetic field in the negative direction again i can force it to go to zero at some negative field age and then the same thing repeats in the other half and this is how the history is loop looks like and we know that uh, the area of the history is loop b or m equal to m dot t h if you say m is equal to chi h chi h so chi h d h and the area under the curve is half chi h square this is the in one cycle this is the energy spent in the system and this is energy actually if you take a ferromagnetic material 
through cyclic magnetic fields you will find this in terms of heating of the sample so this is the hysteresis loop of a ferromagnet so if you increase from zero magnet for zero magnetization goes to saturation magnetization goes back to a value which is known as remnant Re this is remnant field where you just bring the magnetic field to zero applied magnetic field but still some value of m remains that's why remnant after that when i go to negative it goes to zero magnetization which is known as a coercive field that means to bring the to bring the magnetization to zero the coercive field then when you go increase in the negative side just this part is followed again it goes to negative side saturation and then this cycle repeats so this is a whole cycle known as magnetic hysteresis loop hysteresis because you lose power every time you go through one cycle of this hysteresis loop and it is evident when you do this that's how the transformer if you have some magnetic material inside a transformer it gets heated up but now this hysteresis loop also has several properties i have drawn one for a ferromagnet which is a hard ferromagnet if i consider which is a soft magnetic material then this loop will be much smaller much smaller so that means the difference between a hard ferromagnet and a soft ferromagnet is that for a hard ferromagnet it is larger for a soft ferromagnet possibly it will be much smaller reason being the area is smaller for this soft ferromagnet and so the heat dissipated is smaller than the hard ferromagnet if it is a diamagnetic material then the induced magnetization small but will be in the negative direction so in case of a diamagnetic material h versus m or b what a plotting it should show a linear inverse direction that means for h positive it is negative and for h negative it will be positive so it will oppose the applied magnetic field and for anti ferromagnets where the average s is zero for an anti ferromagnet for an anti ferromagnet again it should show a very narrow loop very narrow loop circle on the zero so there are various cases where even this loop can shift left on right and you can say there is something called uh, interface exchange interaction so those will come to later but the fact is that even from the hysteresis loop of a material you can at least the order state you can make some idea whether it is ferromagnet or uh, anti ferromagnet or a soft magnet or a hard magnet from this so this is the integrated diagram of various kinds of materials for a paramagnetic material it is almost similar like uh, diamagnetic but the fact is that paramagnetic materials don't oppose the field and as we apply field the magnetic energy increases and somewhat tries to align the magnetic moments in the direction of the applied field so you get a loop which looks like the green loop so i have shown you the first experiment that one will be doing uh, when one makes a sample that is the measurement of the magnetic hysteresis loop and you can see that there is a saturation magnetization sometimes the magnet is difficult to align and in that case your in that case your hysteresis loop even if you apply a high field will not reach saturation and before that you have to might be doing coming back in negative in the field direction because this is this is a hard magnet and even large magnetic fields are required to align them compared to what you have maybe in your experimental facility so next lecture i will briefly mention the various magnetic exchange interactions which are important 
for understanding the alignment in our systems. So there are direct exchange which I discussed just now, but there is something called super exchange. There are indirect and double exchange interactions. Importantly, there is something called RKKY, a Ruderman Kittel Kasua interaction, which is through conduction electrons. And there's an interesting kind of interaction, what known as DM or Zialoshinsky Moria interaction and dipolar exchange interaction. I will briefly take you to some of these interactions which are important in case of neutron diffraction and the final structure. So with this I end this module.